Hello, I'm Ralph Tyrrell. I was born in Chonford in 1923. At the age of 15, my grandfather offered me an apprenticeship at the Essex Chronicle. Uh, this I carried on for five years, and during 1939, most of the young men went away uh, to the war because they were in the Territorial Army, leaving just three apprentices to look after production with the old men. The Air Training Corps was first formed in 1941 and I was one of the first uh, cadets to join the squadron so today I'm classed as a founder cadet and I use that organisation as a stepping stone to join the Royal Air Force having a volunteer for aircrew duties and so in 1941, December 1941, I joined the Royal Air Force at RF Romford where they gave me a severe medical. After that, I gave, was given a rally warrant to spend three days with the RAF at Oxford on three days attestation tests. This included further medicals and uh, educational exams, etc., etc., including blowing up a blowing up a uh, tube of mercury for less than, for more than 60 uh, seconds. When the three days was over, the sergeant said, well, I've got good news and bad news. The good news, you've all passed and you've joined the Royal Air Force, and today I'll give you your Air Force number. The bad news is that we've got so many recruits, we can't cope with you, so we're going to place you on deferred service. Later on, in 1942, my mother came into this at Chronicle to give her a railway warrant for me to report to Air Crew Reception Centre at the Lord's Cricket Ground in London in July 1942. So from there on, the things began to uh, get into the training uh, system, going to ITW at Stratford upon Avon, and also um, waiting then for a boat to take us to Canada to, to uh, uh, train for the Air uh, Training Corps uh, syllabus and um, consequently it took 10 days to cross the Atlantic, landing in Halifax, uh, Canada, and then on to uh, our flying training courses. Eventually the training started, died first posted was the 31 Bombing and Gunnery School at Picton, not far from Toronto. Here I'd done an air gunner's course, and a bomb aimers course. After passing out for three months, I was then transferred to an air navigation school at number seven uh, air navigation school at Portage La Prairie, uh, about 50 miles west of uh, Winnipeg. This included um, dead retinue navigation and uh, uh, bombing on various uh, bombing ranges. At the end of that three months, uh, we returned back to Moncton in New Brunswick, waiting for a boat to take us back, having qualified as a, an observer f uh, for flying duties. On, on landing in Southampton from Canada, we were immediately sent up to Harrogate for kitting out, and then from there on we were posted to various stations. The first thing was I went to an advanced flying unit near Stourbridge in uh, Wolverhampton and then on to number 17 OTU Silverstone where we got crewed up for a crew of six to fly Wellington bombers. We flew for about three months getting to know each other before being posted to number 1660 heavy conversion unit at RF Swinderby in Lincolnshire where we were converting from two engine planes to four engine bombers, picking up the uh, flight engineer which made a crew of seven. After passing out at the heavy conversion unit, we went to a Lank finishing school at RF Syreston to learn more about the Lancaster before finally being posted to uh, an operational squadron which was number 207 squadron based at RF Spilsby, about 12, 40 miles from Skegness uh, Holiday Resort. Uh, during that time, um, the crew took part in various operations uh, over uh, enemy territory, 
Uh, mostly the targets were for oil and uh, communications. Fortunately for us, although the casualty rate was very high, we managed to see through the tour of operations. Consequently, that uh, when the war was over in Europe, we were earmarked to go to uh, uh, Tidal Force, which was a bomber command, to go and bomb Japan. Fortunately, Japan capitulated after two atomic bombs, so we then decided to um, fly backwards and forwards to Italy, bringing troops back from either Naples or Barry uh, as part of the bringing the troops home from the Middle East. Uh, this carried on for about six or seven times before the crew was made redundant in December 1945. The crew had flown together for 18 months. At the end of that time we said goodbye to each other, having met as strangers that flew together as brothers. Our, our air gunners never fired in anger, although we were on the alert all the time from takeoff to landing. Uh, we were very fortunate. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, personally, I always said a little prayer to the man upstairs, saying, Dear God, please take care of us during the coming perils of the night. And I think he answered my prayer because today I'm just the only survivor of the crew of seven. All the rest have passed on during the end of the war. But uh, I am now in relationship with the uh, mid upper gunner's grandson and the son of the flight engineer and just recently we met up to uh, unveil the new memorial at the squadron uh, where I flew from in Spilsby. I just remember the Christian names of the crew. Uh, Johnny was the pilot, Bert was the flight engineer, Ron was the navigator, Dennis was the um, wireless operator, uh, George was a rear gunner and Bert was the mid-upper gunner and we called each other by Christian names although we had a strict uh, telecom uh, communication when flying nevertheless uh, we were flew together as, as I said before as brothers and we never let each other down and it was a sad occasion when we had to say goodbye because the Air Force no longer needed bomber command uh, anymore we'd done our duty we done a duty unfortunately it cost the lives of 55,573 young men and today uh, we honour their memory and very proud of what uh, they carried out you know, on behalf of the uh, people of this country and the freedom that we enjoy today. Uh, the Bomber Command unveiling of the memorial tomorrow at Green Park, fortunately I've got ticket uh, to go up there and I shall be with perhaps another 3,000 uh, veterans to remember the times past and also to the honour the memory of those brave young men whose average age was only 20 who never never came back and so I shall constantly always remember them and when I hear the sound of a Merlin engine I immediately look up to see if it's a Lancaster. Fortunately, unfortunately we don't see many of them today but today I'm looking forward to see the Lancaster dropping poppies over the uh, veterans uh, for this special occasion. Yes, I have flown in one Lancaster. Um, it was in ni March 1969, flying from Beacon Hill to Levenham, and the plane now is called Just Jane and is based at East Kirkby in Lincolnshire, where it does uh, runway tracking uh, for people who wish to take advantage of feeling what it was like to fly in a Lancaster bomber. Although they didn't experience the, uh, the long journeys that we had, which is an average of eight or nine hours sometimes 10. No, only once uh, we were badly holed in one of the uh, tanks and consequently we lost a lot of fuel and uh, the flight engineer warned the pilot that we were running short of fuel and we immediately landed at RF Manston in Kent and when we landed at uh, there at the end of the runway all the engines uh, had stopped so we just managed to get in on what you call a wing and a prayer but fortunately we were able to be re refilled and uh, the uh, ground crew, which I like to pay tribute to, they kept us going and they were done a valiant and wonderful job. Now, we had a job to do and we were given the targets. We had no choice of target. It was a question of, there's your target, there's the time to be at the target and hopefully we will be back 
eggs and bacon next morning. Knowing what you know now, would you personally have dropped a bomb on Hiroshima if it ended the war? Yes, I would. Well, it's a quick, if we'd have gone to Japan, there would have been a lot, lot more casualties uh, invading that country, and uh, the slaughter had been immense. And uh, there has been enough slaughter, so the time's come now to say goodbye to war, and hopefully the youth of the day will not experience what the youth of yesterday experienced. Although, hopefully, um, if the time comes for the country to call to arms again, I'm sure that they would turn out just the same as we did. Thank you've, you. You've been very involved with youth organisations and, and you've been working for peace really, haven't you, since yeah. the war. Tell us a bit about that. Well, I've been uh, with the Air tra Training Corps uh, as an instructor, as a commanding officer, as a chairman and as president, uh, trying to teach youngsters uh, adventure and venture, of self-assertive and uh, dis self-discipline to be a better citizen and uh, we've achieved that uh, over the years and uh, there's been countless cadets gone through the uh, squadron and I think they value the experience they, they had and uh, it, they've turned out better men and women. No training, the thing is you went through examinations and the powers that the uh, picture for either uh, a pilot or a navigator or bomb aimer, etc. Uh, etc. Et and consequently, um, uh, that's where, <coughs> under the Empire Air Training Scheme, I, I found myself in Canada. But today I look back and I've done an air gunner's course, a bomb aimer's course, and an air navigator's course. So uh, in December 1943, I graduated at number seven air observer school at Portage La Prairie which is a station about 50 miles west of Winnipeg, and where we all got our brothers. And then it was home then to this country and uh, looking forward to uh, flying on operations. That's another story. How did you feel about the, the young men that didn't come back during, uh, during your tour, during operations? Well, we, we, we were friends with them, but unfortunately we were so busy at the time they come and go, and uh, this was part of life, really. You got used to it, seeing old crews go and new crews come in. Uh, the uh, casualty rate was very, very high. The chances of getting through a tour of operations was about 25%. Uh, um, the life of the Lancaster and its crew was measured in weeks. But uh, as I said before, I believed in God, and I'm quite sure he heard my prayer each night I took off, and. Uh, that's why I'm here today having this interview. It was called EM Ku Queen from 207 Squadron, 5 Group, Bomber Command. And when they the finished uh, operations in this country, I'm afraid uh, we had to take it to an airfield in Gloucestershire and say goodbye to it. It had been a very faithful plane to us, never let us down. Um, and that and the valiant air, uh, ground crew, uh, we never turned back once for a malfunction. So. Good luck to the ground crew because they never had the uh, uh, praise that they would uh, richly deserve. Um, so, so tomorrow I shall still recall what our ground crew done for us, uh, keeping us flying and watching us take off and seeing us when we came back. And nothing ever malfunctioned all the time right on the squadron. So good, fair praise to the uh, ground crew. Um, if we're on operation, uh, the briefing was normally about three o'clock in the afternoon. It's a, a very big briefing room. If there was a, a full-scale um, operation, there would probably be 40 Lancasters taken off that night from the station, two squadrons, and we would be briefed. We didn't know the target until the uh, commanding officer drew the curtains back, and then we realised what the target was. There was a, normally a groan how far it was to go, uh, but uh, the briefing would be by the um, uh, navigating leader, the engineering leader, the intelligence officer, the met man telling us what sort of weather to expect and so on and so forth. But then after that was all over, then the navigator and myself would do a flight plan which would take about 45 minutes because we never went straight to a target. There was a series of dog legs which uh, had to be worked out exactly and on time. Uh, we done that and uh, after that was all over then we would go back to our air crew um, 
centre to uh, fit out our flying boots and put our kit on, May West, etc, etc. And then the WEF drivers will then take us to our waiting um, Lancaster at a dispersal point. And then uh, the time of takeoff was, uh, say, 6 o'clock. The f ground crew would be there to start the engines up with the skipper. And we would then gradually um, taxi out of the um, dispersal point and join the queue of Lancasters uh, like a huge a snake uh, meandering to the main runway. And I used to look at the Lancasters in front and behind and thought, well, some of those poor chaps are not going to come back tonight, but we will be all right. And that's, that's the faith I had uh, in the, the crew and the plane and the ground crew kept us flying. At takeoff, uh, I used to be behind a pilot calling out the airspeed and uh, the airspeed uh, would gradually increase as more power was applied. The skipper would say full power and we would take off at 90 miles an hour. Once that was airborne, uh, I would then go and sit with the navigator and start reading off radar uh, fixes off the uh, G and H2S radar and he would uh, then plot those onto his plotting chart. About a half hour from the target, I would climb away from him, would climb underneath the flight engineer's legs and go into the bombay, which is just, just here, and uh, lay on my stomach, listening to the um, master bomber's instructions of what to do uh, when you arrived at the target. The bomb uh, aimer's position was quite prone, and you could see an awful lot of flak and searchlights coming up, but you concentrated on the uh, gratty cool on your bomb site to get him gradually towards the target area. Uh, immediately, um, uh, I was about uh, uh, five minutes from the target. I used to ask the pilot to open the bomb doors. There was a lot more vibration with the bomb doors being open, and consequently, I was listening to the what I should do do from the master bomber. And uh, when the target came up into my gratty cool, I said, "Bomb's going. Bomb's gone. Close bomb doors." And uh, that was it. Then I would go back to the navigator and uh, again do some more radar plotting with him and making sure that we dropped all the bombers there was no hang-ups because that did happen sometimes. So I made sure that the bomb bay was clear and uh, then I said to the skipper, let's go home. And home we went. Looking forward to seeing the White Cliffs of Dover about six o'clock in the morning. And then it was eggs and bacon for the crew. And that was our night. And this we done on more than one occasion, but today I'm remembering those who didn't come back. Uh, but hopefully the country will still remember those brave young men whose average age was only about 20, 21.